So Friday night, that was about as inaccurate as I've seen Ireland for a while. Yeah. What yeah. do you reckon? Well, I was shocked. And I was shocked around the unforced errors. Um, but then you look at it back and watched it again. And I'm like, fair play, New Zealand defended really well. Because Ireland have always been a team that likes to put on shape and attack and layers of attack and options. There's always two, three options to a ball player out the back short. But they don't make the, those errors historically. Where Ireland, I thought, came up short was a little bit of New Zealand's strong defence and winning that physical battle. But also, and we've said it on here before, around Leinster and around Ireland, what they have got away with at breakdowns from an attacking and a defensive perspective, they didn't get any freedom to clear out or any freedom to cheat in the breakdowns that they've got away with, which good teams do generally get away with at times. He was very officious, would be the word. Um, and how they were refereed was fair. You know, James Ryan gave a few away for not rolling away and, you know, other days they're allowed to get away with that sort of stuff and it slows up the attack and for the opposition, whatever, whatever. But, yeah, they were inaccurate and coupled with you know their lack of discipline or perceived lack of discipline, they got caught out competing hard. You know, you go to Henderson one in the second half. Um, yeah, it's touch and go. Does he release him? Then he's over the ball. And another day he gets the penalty for holding on. Um, but what they didn't do is learn on the hoof island um, and react to how it was being refereed by Nick Berry, who some people said, oh, he used his whistle too much and it ruined the game. Well, you ref what you see and, you know, Ireland were caught out a little bit with their lack of discipline and, you know, they didn't react on the hoof around how he was refereeing the game. And you add in that, the errors they made, the missed tackles, you know, how New Zealand just managed the game in tough condition, toughish conditions, but, you know, a six-day turnaround, they, you know, they didn't complicate things in New Zealand, did they? They won the physical battle. They barred up defensively. You know, Mackenzie kicked his goals. Mackenzie managed the game really well, got the ball in front of his pack at times. They soaked up a lot of the Irish attack by not blitzing out the line and, and staying connected and then winning those collisions, which made second, third, fourth phase for Ireland tough because they're not over the game line. And um, it was a, I thought it was a, a very solid New Zealand performance without being sort of glittery and glamorous and, you know, loads of ball out the back and looking sharp and wow moments. You know, they were very clinical in what they did and Ireland's discipline and, and you know, inaccuracies ball in hand cost them dearly. I did see one stat on rugby pass and I hope they're right. But it was around the line breaks that the All Blacks had nine and yeah. Ireland had one. Yeah. And this is what I was trying to chat to Biggs about last week, you know, about the innovation of New Zealand against the Blitz D. And yeah. They've always been the kind of front runners when it comes to attack. They just looked more comfortable across the board. And I think it's because they've been playing in the championship. They've had longer together in that and the standard of rugby that they've had. And Scott Robertson's had this bedding in period and he's found some absolute gems and superstars amongst the ranks coming through. Mm. Um, the fact that it was a six-day turnaround and the history of the two games and this kind of the story and the narrative that was built up, that's as poor as I've seen Ireland, just mm. everything around them, the energy, um, the, the kind of, I don't want to say desire because I don't want to question that, but just everything around what they were doing, like the scrum, um, the innovation. Um, yeah, I don't know. It was it was as, as poor as I've seen them under Andy Farrell. That's a fair comment. I think it really is. And, you know, then you look at it, but I'm more so saying that's because of how the, good the All Blacks were in those conditions and how they played and how they fronted up physically and put, stopped Ireland from getting on the front foot and getting offloads away. Um, you know, and Ireland's discipline around the breakdown was poor as well, which meant momentum was uh, sort of stunted. But yeah, you know, the error rate w w was bad. Well, that's the thing. Like with even when Kieran Frawley came on, like he's dropped. Did he drop two high balls? Yeah. I'm not saying that they're easy skills, but for a player of that quality. And it was just, you could feel the energy in the stadium. Like the, that, You don't see Ireland doing that. Back no. in the 90s, the late 90s, they might have been doing that. Yeah. Sorry, Rog. <laughs> uh, not you specifically. Um, 
Yeah, I don't know. It was uh, a hard one being in the Northern Hemisphere and a part of me wanting Ireland to do well because I've picked them to be World Cup winners in 2027. Yeah, you just said, you said that for Dublin and fans and then you let them down by going home early. Got but, fans. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Like, it was flat, wasn't it? And I heard someone complaining that no wonder there was no atmosphere in the stadium. Like, I was buzzing on Friday to watch that game. I'd had yeah. a good night's sleep, you know, from after <laughs> our night out in Dublin. I was... I have my dinner ready. I'm like, kids, get it to bed. I'm sitting down. I'm watching this game. I was so excited to watch it. I fell asleep in the second half, probably because I'm still struggling a bit from the Wednesday night in Dublin. But it was one of them that it felt underwhelming, Ireland's performance, and it was a stodgy game. It was stop-start. Um, yeah, and so I saw someone online saying, you know, what do you expect? You know, a lack of atmosphere when the cheapest ticket was 125 euros. Um, so again, it's that. And that's the thing. I, I don't think brush over that. I think it, that was what you got from it. I had some mates there and they said it was like basically like a 45 year old second marriage round stag party. Mm. Everyone was absolutely blitzed. It was like a big kind of corporate thing. The price of the of the tickets, the whole energy in the lead up to the game. And I spoke about at the beginning of the show, the kind of when the players are walking out into the the, into the arena they walked out into the gladiator theater the gladiator was stood there paul mescal yeah he was in the crowd as well and bang it was drained out and we went back into the dark ages of what rugby used to be get the fucking lights off build the hysteria and get bring the crowd as pissed as they might be as old and middle class as they may be get them on side but i, I just feel from that moment there and the hacker was great, Rico Yuani, but you could see, even in that moment there, you could see that they were there on a six-day turnaround and it was fucking personal, thanks to Johnny Sexton. And Ireland didn't show that that was the case. And that's a very superficial thing to say because the game is more than that. Mm. And I'm an old romantic and a horror show when it came to that emotion and giving away penalties and discipline and all that. But this game for Ireland was primed for that. And that's what I'm most kind of shocked a little bit about about their performance yeah and I think I said it I didn't really feel the Friday night vibe I was excited for the game but maybe the whole Friday night vibe wasn't what was wanted for Ireland against the All Blacks but then you look into the stats and you look into other things and you look into impact of benches Ireland were in front and obviously there's the yellow card to Geordie Barrett which was a yellow card and you know they get ahead and then they give a few penalties away and New Zealand get momentum the impact of the bench and Jim's just said the game's changing, right? Yeah, when you're comparing it to the likes of what New Zealand have got and what South Africa have got and all this stuff. Ireland on the bench, they bring off Peter Amani, 35 years of age, Conor Murray, 35 years of age, Kean Healy, 37 years of age. Um, and that's not a slight on them because they've all been very good players. But as the Southern Hemisphere seems to be getting stronger, you know, are the, the, are the Northern Hemisphere clinging on a little bit to players that have had their time. I don't know. Well, Alan Quinlan said that. I saw Did something he? on off the ball. He said exactly that. He said it's time for the likes of Craig Casey and Ryan Beard and these players to start kind of being given. I don't know what their injury profile is. There might be a, a reason for that. And I know that Kieran Forley come on and Jamie Osborne, they're young lads. But Alan Quinlan called that as well, which is something I've not thought about. Yeah. I've never thought about Ireland as an Asian team, but we know, I think, what you're referencing there. We know the importance of the bench. Yeah. It's everything now, yeah. especially with how close these top one, two, three, four, five teams are. Yeah. And how good Patrick Tupelot has been when he's come on for the past two yeah. weeks. 100%. Well, talking of age, he does look a lot older. Than <laughs> than <he is. laughs> I, don't know what he, I don't know what he is. He looks older than me and Jim, but he's at least 20 years younger, probably. I'll tell you who was good off the bench, who made a big impact. Cam Royguard at nine, I mm. thought, was outstanding. Yeah. Speed of ball. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah, he, he really was. Yeah, he's a big fan of him. Actually. Yeah. And that's the thing, when Jim just mentioned someone like Craig Casey coming on, that's the impact that Craig Casey could have. Whereas... You know, sometimes you're looking at a bench and you're like, oh, I ain't got a lot to come on here mm. to change and up, you know, lift the pace of the game. And yeah, you know, that's where New Zealand certainly had the better of the two teams. A big shout out has got to go to Scott Robertson, Razor, friend of the show. And I'm sure it's the message, Andrew, that I sent him yeah. in the week, mate. Yeah, that kind of inspired him to let him know that the boys are in town and that, you know, there's a part of us that's, that's with him. I sent him a selfie in my new... 
Hugo Boss leather pilot jacket. And uh, I said, the Eagles have landed, Razor. Roger that eagle. He texted me back. <laughs> he wanted to roger you? He, well, he, I think he was just saying he, he accepts that we're here and they're ready. Let's, let's, we'll finish it with this. A six-day turnaround. Yeah. A coach that was under a bit of, of pressure during the championship. Ian Foster took the All Blacks to a final. Many people think he was hard done by. The Franz favourite in Scott Robertson comes in. You can see now. Mm. He's turned that team around both from 1 to 15, the strength in depth, beating England, now beating Ireland. Like, fuck it. I know France, they've got history in Paris. He's got history in France as well, but it almost feels like the pressure's now off them. Of course they want to go and beat France, but yeah. if they go home, having beaten England and Ireland, you've done well. Pod, 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 pod. Rugby pod.